some of you already know because she did the part, part of her PhD here in the institute. As she was one year since uh, 2012, 2013. Uh, she has been working in anticipating synchronization in neural circuit. It's something that she's going to, to talk today. She did a very nice modeling to explain some experiments in monkeys that were uh, published by a group in the United States. So she did a very good job doing the PhD. And things like that, she got a permanent position already in Brazil, in Maceió, where she's in the Institute of Physics in the University of Managua, and the, where she's teaching a lot. As it would happen here, you get, uh, you get a, new, a new permanent position. But, uh, but she's still working very hard also in research. And it's, uh, for me, it's a pleasure that she's here and telling us what she has been doing in the last months. Thank okay. you, Fernanda. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, so the idea is to talk about what physicists can do in neuroscience and <laughs> or computational neuroscience, as we typically call. Uh, one of the greatest questions in neuroscience is how to relate the structural connectivity, the anatomic connectivity of the brain, to the uh, functional connectivity, to the brain, the signals that we can measure in different experiments. So there is a huge movement in the world with these uh, connectom projects trying to relate structural and functional connectivity. What's that? So one part of the community is trying to understand how neurons are connected, uh, which are the synapses, which are the fibers, really anatomical connection from this neuron here or this cortical region here to the thalamus, to the hippocampus. And they are interesting, for example, in there is a connection between the visual cortex and the motor cortex. How many connections per neuron? How many synapses? What's the probability of finding a connection between two neurons in this region? So what's the topological organization of the brain anatomy? On the other hand, there is a group of scientists trying to understand how these neurons communicate with each other. It means uh, understand the information flow. See. Uh, the electroactivity flowing from one region to the other regions and other regions depending on the task you are doing. So this can change a lot of time during your day. So the idea is that when you analyze real synapses, they can be modified by synaptic plasticity. For example, spike time independent plasticity or STDP uh, as a learning process or a memory process. So when you learn something, the structural connectivity can be reshaped. But this takes some time. Could be a few minutes, hours, days, or years. On the other hand, when you're talking about uh, functional connectivity flow of information, these modifications can be very fast. So modulated by attention, for example, they have to change the flow of information in the brain. For example, if you are on the beach, um, looking to the sea, it's not necessary that your visual cortex is communicating to your motor cortex. But if suddenly <laughs> appears a lion, a bear, a shark in my city, or whatever, then you need a fast communication from the visual area to the, cort to the motor cortical area to, in order for you to run, to escape. So we try to analyze these modifications in the, in the same structural connection. So what we really do is to uh, analyze these brain signals from different kind of experiments, from EEG in humans, uh, electroencephalogram, a non-invasive technique, when you are in resting state or when you are doing a cognitive test, for example, look into the screen and press a button when you see a target, for example. Or in animals, in monkeys with local field potential or in mouse in different species, and then we use statistical measures to identify this functional connectivity during different tasks. You can, we can use coherence, correlation between neurons, between areas. We can see the phase difference between these two areas. We can try to infer the causality. So we can use different statistical measures for causality. There are a lot of them. Some are 
useful in one situation, some are useful in other situations. And then, with this information about functional connectivity, we try to develop biological plausible models, which we know the structural connectivity because we built these connectivity patterns. And we see that if our biological models can reproduce these functional uh, properties that we found in the brain signals. Uh, we have different ways to do this, to model the neuronal data. One way is to use large-scale model. You consider large populations of neurons, mesoscale models that represent a cortical part of the brain, or the thalamus, or the hippocampus. And the, we can compare these models with EEG or LFP. On the other hand, we can use neuronal scale level to model the neurons. We need that few neurons to have a proper feature that we want. And the special thing is that each neuron fires spikes. So we have a lot of different models for that. In any case, large scale or small scale, we can consider the idea of motifs that are, if we consider three neurons or three neuronal populations as nodes, there are several ways of uh, these nodes, nodes can connect to each other. But when we analyze anatomical uh, matrix really from the, the brain, we can find that some uh, motifs, for example, this M9 motif, appears a lot. So there is a high probability for some kind of motifs. For example, if you have three, one is connected to the other two, but the other two are not connected between them. So this motifs idea can be useful for us to understand these features of the brain signals. However, typically people consider only excitatory connections between these regions. And um, almost all the recent papers, they do not consider the relation between excitatory and inhibitory connections here. So this is what we are interested in. What happens if we have, okay, this kind of topology, but this synapse is different from this synapse? This is very common in the brain and can affect the, the dynamics of our motif. And that's what we are trying to do. So with this idea of inhibition, we are going to consider two new phenomena that have been reported in the last years and didn't have a model to explain them. And we are going to model these neuronal populations and this motif. And I'm going to show you that we have a model that can reproduce some of these features of the brain. The first one is the unidirectional causality with negative phase lag. So in 2004, it was reported en passant in a paper in PNS, AS. They applied these causality measures to different regions of the macaque monkey uh, cortex. And they verified the information flow from different areas. For example, from area two to one, and from area three to one, and they report this uh, connectivity, and they comment that it's not necessary that this connectivity was represented in the time delay values derived from phase spectra. The phase difference between the two signals were not consistent with the directional of a Granger causality. So. For physicists, it's well known that correlation does not imply causation. So if we see two signals that are correlated and have a different phase, it doesn't mean for us that one region causes the other region, or one signal causes the other signal. However, in neuroscience, people typically assume that if you see two correlated signals with a time difference between them, we expected that this time difference is due to the synapses time scale. So they expected that if visual cortex is sending information to motor cortex, once you see a peak in the activity of the visual cortex, after a while you will see a peak in the activity of motor circuit. But in this experiment, they didn't find this relation. They find an opposite relation. They find that sometimes 
Region 2 will send to Region 1, but they see a peak in Region 1 before the peak in Region 2. And these two centers are all that they put in the paper. Then in 2012, another group with different tests for the monkey, with different brain areas, verified the same kind of unidirectional causality from post posterior parietal region to prefrontal cortex region. And they saw a huge amount of information flowing from here to here. But they verified that the prefrontal cortex, the receiver region, leads in phase the sender region. And they just comment these two centers and reported the last paper in 2004. So this is all in the literature by this time, 2012. OK, this is the first phenomenon. The second phenomenon, after 10 years or more, talking about zero leg synchronization and trying to find zero leg and model for zero leg and zero leg is good for communication, is good for the binding problem, is good for everything in the brain, in the brain. then people start to say, oh, there are a lot of experiments that don't have zero leg. They have phase difference. And there are phase, di phase diversity. We can find many ways of having phase difference during the same experiment. So we can find phase difference, phase diversity in space or in time or among subjects. And there is a paper from the beginning of this year talking about the possible functionalities for these phase difference that they were not paying attention before. OK, phase difference, everything. If, if you have a signal, you take a Fourier transform of the signal. You can have the magnitude, but you can have the phase of the signal. If you have two signals and you compare, you can find the phase relation between these two signals. That could be from two different brain regions. For example, you can have the signal of one region in oscillatory mode, which is common in the brain, and you can have another region, and this could be the phase difference or the time difference, the time delay, the expression that I will use, the time delay between these two signals can vary across space or time and whatever during different tasks. But there is no models, as far as I know, there are no models that, have, that present this kind of phase. And there are few works with LFP in monkeys showing that this phase diversity in fact exists. Okay, so you can find histograms see many phase difference between the same two seeds, sites, for example, prefrontal cortex and, cortex and posterior parietal cortex. Okay? You are saying that the majority of the experiment show that the phase is negative. Uh, because this of, the, of the histogram you showed there? Yes, but they, they appeal that they decide to, to uh, choose, for example, this region of the brain minus this region, so this could be negative. But if they choose this region minus this region, this will be positive. The point is that for us, I will say after, when we apply Granger causality together with phase, we can say that the positive or the negative depends on who is the sender and who is the receiver. But if, if you have no information about the connections between two regions, you can choose the phase A minus B or B minus A, okay? That's what they did because they are only look to the phase in this specific uh, paper. So that's our idea. We are going to use the ideas of anticipated synchronization that have been studied a lot here in, phys in physical systems, in lasers, in semiconductors, um, and we are going to replace the delays that I'm going to explain in a minute by inhibition. And we're going to see that these inhibitory synapses can modulate the phase relations. So our model can explain these strange phase reports reported in different experiments. We can explain the unidirectional causality with negative phase. We can explain phase relation diversity. And we can also explain 
synaptic weight distribution when we apply plasticity. I'm not sure if I have time to talk about this part, but it's here in the end we can talk. For now, I'm going to focus on these two, specifically in the first one, because we're going to call this unidirectional causality with negative phase exactly as anticipated synchronization. We are going to see that it's almost the same idea. So, what is anticipated synchronization for, for who, who doesn't heard before? If we have two dynamical systems, so physical systems, it's not necessary to be neuron, but you can also consider a model for neurons, a master dynamical sister system and a slave dynamical system, what's that? We are saying that we have a function describing the master system that is the same one describing the slave system, but the slave system receives some information of the master. It means if we have two dynamical systems unidirectionally connected and the slave systems also receive a negative delayed self-feedback here, it means information about itself delayed in time, so from the past, a trivial solution of these equations is the slave system in a time t is equal the master system in a time t plus td because these two terms cancel. Do you see? But this means that the slave predicts now what the master will do in the future. So this is a solution, this is a stable solution in many, of, in many experiments. There is no violation of causality because it's not a linear system. You need a transient time to achieve the anticipated synchronization regime. And this idea is very nice even if you want to compare to neuronal data. This, is, this was done here in 2003. Oh, let's use the idea of anticipated synchronization but with neuronal models. Let's say that the master and the slave can be described by a Fitzhugh-Nagomo neural model. If we do that and we couple it, coupled them directly and do this term saying that the slave received this delayed negative self-feedback here, we can find anticipated synchronization for a large range of parameters. However, this term is not very biological. You cannot go to a biologist and ask, oh, could you do an experiment with real neurons that have these kind of dynamics? And he's going to say, oh, it's hard to do this synapse here, but we can try. Then, we decide, okay, maybe if we replace this strange term for biologists by inhibition, which biologists love it, we can find this same kind of anticipation. It means we can find that the master do spikes after the slave do the same spikes, okay? So this is what we did. We replaced this simple system, master, slave, with negative self-feedback by a master, a slave, and a third neuron. This third neuron now projects inhibitory synapses in the slave. So the complete loop, excitatory synapse from the slave to the interneuron, and the inhibitory synapses from the interneuron to the slave can do the, the role of this old term here. And then the system is more complicated than that now because the synapses are also dynamical systems, so we cannot describe it by just two systems, but we can do simulations. We can see what happened in the computer. To do that, we should choose a neuronal model, a synaptic model, the external um, noise that are going to use, and we can do all that with biological features, holikin huxley models, umpire gala synapses, external current that could be constant in the beginning and then we can add a Poisson input. I'm going to talk about both cases. And the important parameters for us here are the conductance. The excitatory conductance from the master to the slave and the inhibitory conductance from the interneuron to the slave. These parameters 
can change the phase difference between these three neurons, as I'm going to show. So, if you have the simplest case here, master, slave, we have what we expect. We put this system to oscillate with no connection between them, so we have the master spiking here, the slave spiking here, no correlation. If we add this connection here, then the system takes a transient and we go to a phase locking regime in which we have a spike of the master in black and after a while a spike of the slave in red. So we have master, slave, master, slave, master, slave. This is trivial, this is what we expect because the master do a spike, send the excitatory synapse, then the slave do the spike. However, when we add this inhibitory constant inhibitory conductance here in all the system, we can find a situation in which the slave do a spike and after that the master do a spike. What's happening here? So when we start with small inhibitory conductance, the time difference between the spike of the master and the spike of the slave starts to decrease. So for a small inhibition we have master, slave, master, slave. If we increase, we have master slave, master slave, master slave. If we increase even more, we have master slave together, master slave together, master slave together. If we increase even more, we have slave master, slave master, slave master. So we have this non trivial solution here that we call anticipated synchronization regime for the, these three neurons. What's happening? If we look, to the time delay, the time difference between the spike of the master and the spike of the neuron as a function of this inhibition here, that's this inhibition here, we can see that when the inhibition is zero, we have a positive time, master slave, but as we increase the inhibition, we can get the anticipated synchronization regime passing through the zero leg regime here. So we have Master slave, master slave, master slave. Very fast, master slave, master slave, master slave. Here, then we have the opposite. Slave master, slave master, slave master. And then we can get quite good anticipation time here. So we have slave, master, slave, master, and so on. So if you, we look to all the conductance, the excitatory conductance from the master to the slave and the inhibitory conductance from the interneuron to the slave, we can find a big region of anticipated synchronization and a big region of delayed synchronization, the usual synchronization. We can also find a region of phase drift. So if we try to increase so much this inhibition, the system lost the phase locking and the frequency of the master and the slave are different now. So we cannot define a time delay in this situation. Then, this is for constant current, so the neurons are periodic, so we have phase lockings. So we can consider each neuron as a phase oscillator, for example. You can use, we can use a Kuramoto model to try to describe these phases, or these phase differences, sorry. This is what we are doing now. We use this Kuramoto-like um, for the phase of the, each neuron. So the derivative of the phase depends on the own frequency of the neuron and depends on the coupling between the neurons. But um, besides these two terms, we add a synaptic delay term between these two neurons. This term is doing the job of the of a uh, delay between this in the synapse of this neuron to this neuron, for example. So using this Kuramoto model, we can find analytical solutions for the phase difference between the neurons. Here we couple them in a dynamical relay case in which the neuron in the middle is connected excitatory with the first and the third neuron. And we can find the phase difference between the neuron one and two which is this curve, and between the neuron 1 and 3, which is this zero-like curve, that's an old result that we know. Um, the good point here is that when we compare this analytical solution 
with the Hodgkin-Huxley model, if we model these three neurons with Hodgkin-Huxley or with Hosler oscillate or with Hosler dynamical systems, we can have similar features here. Like the difference, the phase difference depends on this delay here in the coupling. And they are very similar and there are regions of phase drift regimes in which we lost the phase locking regime so we cannot define the phase. With this simple model we can find the same features of these very complicated models. So we apply this to the master slave interneuron motif and we can also find a transition from positive to negative time delay so the phase difference between the master and the slave in this Kuramoto model depending on this delay in the synapse and now also in the inhibitory coupling here that it's from the interneuron to the slave we use a negative coupling and we see that again for Hodgkin, Huxley and Hosler we can have similar results as this one here analytical solution so this is very nice for me at least, but it's very periodic. Then we decided to add some noise to the neurons and see what can happen and see if this anticipation is really anticipation or just a very large leg, as some people like to think. And then when we add noise to the neurons in the synapses, um, independent poisson noise in each neuron, so each neuron is quite different, we can also consider this condition of measure the time delay between the master and the slave. So if we add this noise in the master, since it's a hot and slave neuron, there is a hot fabrication. We can have silent periods. We can have, uh, this is almost periodic, but they are very different if we uh, zoom it. And when we add the slave and the citatory connection here, the slave, I hope you can see it in red. Use it to happen after the master here. So, can you see? As we increase the inhibition, we start to find regions in which the slave predicts the master. If we increase even more, we can find a lot of regions in which, in which it, it happens. And you can again see the time delay between these two regions. But now, we, we can measure the time delay in each period but you need to find a mean time delay. So we say, if we look to the time delay in each cycle, we measure the time delay here, here, and so on in all cycles, we can find a very noise time delay series, but there is a mean and a standard deviation that we can characterize this as a positive mean time delay, the usual delayed synchronization regime. In, on the other hand, if we add this inhibition, the time delay can vary a lot, but we can have a negative mean here. We can find two consecutive periods in which there is slaves before the master. And we can see that this mean value and the average are consistent along a lot of trials and a lot of different initial conditions. So we say that we have anticipated synchronization on average in this case. And we can look to the return map. And there is a concentration here in the delay synchronization and the concentration here in the anticipated synchronization. So we can look again to the time delay as a function of the inhibition, but now we have the time delay here in orange and the standard deviation. It's a lot, but if we could do the experiment, we will see on average the slave anticipating the master, for example. And this is uh, true even if we consider the neurons uh, excitable. So if, if the neurons are below the hop fibrification, so if there is no noise, they are silent, and we just add the noise to make them fire, we can also find anticipation in this case. So we can also look to the histograms of this time difference. And the good point here is that we can compare the coupling, the master-slave interneuron situation with the uncoupled situation. Just the master alone and just the slave interneuron together but separate of the master. 
If we look to the time difference here, we expect a flat distribution because there is no correlation. Even if they want to have the mean frequency, the same mean frequency, there is no correlation, there is no information there. So this is what we see, more or less. And if we couple them, then we have master sending to the slave without inhibition, we can see a sharp peak here in the positive time delay indicating that there is delayed synchronization in the gene. If we add the inhibition, we can find that this uh, narrow peak gets spread and the mean value comes to negative values. We can have a peak here close to the mean values of the distribution, but you can also have a second peak here, indicating that sometimes the slave, in fact, spikes after the master, which means that when the slave spikes before the master, okay, it spikes go to the uh, transient time, cannot spike anymore. But if, he fa if it fails to spike, when the master spikes, the master will send the synapse and then some neurons will spike in a time difference, which is really the time difference of the synaptic time decay. So this is what we have with noise. And if we add excitatory feedback from the slave to the master, just because in a lot of situations in the brain we saw these bidirectional connections, one can be larger than the other, but it's a common feature. We see that the neuron participating the inhibitory, uh, in the inhibitory loop wants to be the leader. So he, it will be the leader more times than the neuron which is not participating in the inhibitory feedback. So if we have no, if we have no excitation from slave to the master here in the beginning, and we start in a delay regime, as we increase the excitation from the slave to the master, we pass master is the leader for positive tau to slave is the leader for negative tau here. And then we continue with the same time delay. If we start from the uh, anticipated synchronization regime and start to increase this excitatory feedback, so the system remains in the anticipated synchronization regime and the slave remains being the leader. And this is a very big region in which the slave is the leader now. And all these results could be tested, experimentally tested in a hybrid patch clump setup, which really exists. There are some papers with that. You patch a real neuron and you simulate the, simulate the other two, the master and the interneuron, and we see what happened with the correlation between them. And if someone knows someone who wants to do that, it, it was a, an idea. We start in this lab in Japan trying to do it, but Things happen and we couldn't finish. This is the screen, this is the patch, this is the pipette, and here is the neuron that we can um, patch and measure the activity. And if we simulate, it's possible to, to verify these results in a real biological system. Okay. These results could be verified outside the brain, but if you, if you want to use uh, data from grains of living animals, we need a better model because it's impossible to realize these three neural motifs inside of the cortex, for example. So we replaced our three neural models for a three neuronal population model. So now, instead of a master slave, we have a master population we have a slave population and we have an interneuron population that have only inhibitory neurons here and send inhibitory synapses back to the slave population. However, since in cortical regions we have a lot of excitatory neurons together with inhibitory neurons, we can, think, we can think that these populations also have inhibitory neurons together with the excitatory neurons. Then we can imagine that these two regions are just one region, a cortical region, that is typically modeled as 80% of the citatory neurons, 
20% of inhibitory neurons, and they are in directional coupling. So we have the master here with excitatory and inhibitory neurons connected uh, randomly, sending excitatory synapses to all these neuron, neurons here in the slave population that are also connected. But in this case, the important parameters for us are this internal inhibition in the slave. So playing with this excitatory from the master to the slave and this inhibitory conductance inside the slave, we can look in for anticipated synchronization regime in neuronal populations. So we can use different neuronal model. We choose Zizikiewicz because he has variability in the kind of neurons. He has physiological time traces that are very similar to real neurons and so on, we choose Ampen Gala, and each neuron receives independent positron input, and these populations can oscillate. We can regulate these positron input uh, to have different main frequencies for these populations. And then we can find again, if we don't, don't have too much inhibition here, we can find the master in black, the mean membrane potential of the master population, so the average of all neurons, there are peaks because it's oscillating with 8 hertz or 7.7. .7. And we have the peak of the slave, which is higher because of the citatory synapses, happen after the peak of the master, as usual. But when we increase this inhibition, this internal inhibition in the slave, we can again find a regime in which the slave presents a peak before the master. So again, we can compare the time delay between these two populations as a function of the inhibition, the internal inhibition here, and we find that for small, for small inhibition, we have this delayed synchronized regime. As we increase, we pass to anticipated synchronized regime but now, if we continue increasing, we don't go to a phase locking regime. So we just come back again to the delayed synchronized regime. Or if we choose different values of the excitatory conductance, here we cannot go to zero because the system go to a stable situation. I can show again, I can show after. And as we increase the inhibition, the system come back to the delayed synchronization regime. So again, we have a large region of the parameter space, the excitatory versus the inhibitory, the time delay, color-coded here, a lot of anticipated synchronization, a lot of delayed synchronization. So we can look to the cross-correlation between the signals. If we look to a delayed synchronization regime, the cross-correlation has a peak, very close to zero, but in the positive, uh, part of the graph. If we look to anticipated synchronization, the cross correlation is in a negative peak. Of course, I choose negative because I choose the cross correlation from the master to the slave. We can also look to histograms because since we have a lot of neurons, we can compare the time delay between neurons in the slave and neurons in the master. A, neuron, a random neuron pick up in the slave and a random neuron pick up in the master. What's going to happen between them? So our histogram is an histogram of the time difference between neurons in this population. We can find that for one specific spike, we cannot say which neuron will be the previous and the follow one. But in average, we find that for delayed synchronized regime, we have master slave, master slave, master slave, and so on. And for anticipated synchronized regime, we have slave, master. Then we go wrong, and we have slave, master again on average. And since we have these uh, probability density, these histograms, we have phase diversity again. We, if we have a two brain regions that are synchronized, but we can measure just few neurons in one region and other region, we can find different phase relations between these neurons, just because we pick them randomly. And we can look to the return map, and here we can see B stable regime. So if we look to the return map, we can find um, delayed synchronization if 
the time delays are in this first quadrant, we can find anticipated synchronizations if the time delays are negative in the third quadrant. But we can differentiate now phase drift in violet to uh, be stable regimes in red. The red stay one time, uh, stay some time here in anticipated and go to delay and then come back to anticipation. And this is considered quite good now, these mood stable regimes, and maybe it's a potential useful idea. So, okay, model, 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 model. Now we can compare to the data. Uh, we found more or less what I explained that people reported in the, in the papers in 2004 and 2012. But if we really want to compare, we have to do the analysis. So uh, we have our model and we get some data from monkey to doing this go, no go activity. So the monkey see some targets in the screen and if the targets match, the monkey has to press a button. If not, he has to suppress this um, <laughs> feeling of press and he cannot press. So during the, the wait period, the period in which the monkey is waiting for the first target, there are a lot of uh, oscillation, there are a lot, for, a lot of regions that are synchronized. So when we have oscillations and we have regions that are synchronized, we have a good um, signal to looking for anticipated synchronization. And then what is necessary is that we do not know if these two regions are unidirectional connected, and more than that, they could be bidirectional connected, but in that specific situation, just the synapses from one region to the other can be activated. So we need causality measures to infer the information flow when the animal is alive. And we use Granger causality, which can be quite complicated to find the spectral Granger causality, but the big idea is that if we have two time series and x1 and x2, if the path of x2 help us to predict the future of x1, we say that x2 Granger calls x1. So if this term here is not zero, so the error here is smaller because we add the information about the path of x2 to predict x1, so we say that x2 calls x1. And then we verify that in the uh, brain, in the monkey experiment, we have four region, five regions, and we have a lot of unidirectional connections from two to one, from five to one, from three to one, from two to five. And we have some regions that are bidirectional connected, but one way is stronger than the other. So again, we have a good framework to looking for anticipated because we have these unidirectional connect connections that are necessary. So we need to analyze phase and the Granger causality. Here we have the data, the LFP, which is very strange. We cannot say anything, just looking for it. We can compare to our model. It seems quite bad, okay, but we can do the Granger causality analysis. Or we can do the coherence spectral analysis first. We can do a power spectrum first. We have two brain regions, A and B. If we do the, tra the Fourier transform, we see that there is a preferential frequency, a main frequency that they are oscillating. If we do the coherence spectrum between the region one and two, or A and B, motor and somatosensory in this case, we can see a big peak of coherence in this frequency around 24 hertz. It means that these populations are not only os uh, oscillating in 24 hertz, but they are synchronized in 24 hertz. Now if we apply the Granger causality, and now the Granger causality can be one way and the other way, if we apply from two to one, we see a very pronounced peak here around 24 hertz. But when we use one to predict the two, applying the range of causality, there is no peak. So one doesn't help us to predict the two. So we say that region two 
Carlos is region one, okay? We can do the same thing for our model, but in our model, we already know that the master should cause the slave. And when we compare these two situations with the phase difference that we find from the, two, the Fourier transform, we see that the region one leads region two in this situation. So we have anticipated synchronization here. If we look to all, so we look to two to one, we find a Granger causality from two to one, but when we look to the phase, we found that one leads in phase. If we look to five to one, we find a Granger causality from five to one, but we find that five leads in phase. So we have a delayed synchronization regime. So we aim that we found anticipated synchronization evidence in the brain with these experiments, which was done many years ago. And we compare uh, the phase difference that we find in the experiments, these stars here, with our model, and we can do pretty good. And we also compare our model to the science paper from 2012 between prefrontal cortex and posterior parietal cortex. They found a phase difference that it's quite similar for the one that we can find with our model for the same frequency. Uh, the idea is that we should look for the space synchronization in new experiments. For example, if we can uh, change, modulate the inhibition in, an, in the area of the brain, uh, applying neuromodulators during the experiments, we can see if the phase difference changed when we block inhibition or not. Um, by now, we don't have access to these experiments, but we are trying to, to find collaboration. But we can analyze data from other experiments that are quite similar. For example, we can do this for EEG in humans because, um, for coincidence, there are some groups of humans that do the same kind of go-no-go -no -go test that the monkeys do. So, the humans have EEG in their heads, uh, non-invasive, and they have to look to a screen and see a first target and wait for a second target. And depending on these two targets, the subject should press or not a button here in the end. So again, in this waiting will, wait window time, there are a lot of oscillation. We can see also in the EEG. And we can do the same kind of analysis with Granger causality and phase difference. So if we look just to the signals, it seems that they are some main frequency. But if we look to the coherence, we can see a negative peak, but we don't know which one's the sender and which one's the receiver. So we need to, to apply a causality measure here. Um, then we apply the, the, the same idea, coherence, Granger, and phase spectrum to two regions in the brain, and we find a peak in the coherence, which means that these two areas, these two electrodes, are synchronized. And we find a peak in the Granger causality just in one direction, saying that this F7 causes this T5. When we look to the phase difference here, we see a negative phase difference indicated that T5 is the leader, okay? So we can also find the opposite. We can also find between different electrodes the delayed synchronized regime. So we have this evidence, as far as I know, for the first time in human data. And we can also compare, if we look to all subjects together and do an average incoherence, bronzer, and phase, we can find this flow of information from one part of the brain to the other. I don't know if you could see the arrows, but almost of the arrows are from the front of the head to the back of the head. So the information during the activity is going back, and we can find a lot of uh, peaks in bronzer, and we can look for negative phase. And we have phase diversity here. This is phase angle considering the, the pair that I choose here. And we see that there are some pairs that are almost zero lag for 
all patients. We have some pairs of electrodes that are in antiphase for almost all patients. But we have some pairs that have almost zero lag, antiphase, and out of phase, both delayed and anticipated synchronization. And we have phase diversity and anticipated synchronization with human data. How, how is my time? Um, how much is it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, five, five more minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Okay. I, this is what we did with these phase relations. I have the three more uh, slides for the spike time independent plasticity. I can only talk very fast. The point is that in neuroscience, uh, it's well known now that if we have a neuron, two neurons, that we apply them to a spike in a specific order, for example, master-slave, 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 the synapse going from master to the slave will increase. This is called long-term potentiation. Otherwise, if we obligate this two neurons to a spike, slave-master, 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 this synapse will decrease. So this is called long-term depression. This is well known in experiments in um, patch clamp and in real neurons. And we think, look, if we have this uh, inhibitory feedback that can make the system go to a master-slave, master-slave configuration to a slave, master, slave, master, we can control the spike time independent plasticity. It means when we have when we have the inhibition here, we're going to have anticipated synchronization. We have slave master, slave master, slave master. The system will go to long-term depression. The plasticity will make this synapse strength decrease. Otherwise, if you have DS, this synapse will increase. So we think, OK, if we have this old uh, figure that I showed to you for populations of neuron, excitatory synapses, inhibitory synapse, a big region of anticipation and a big region of delay. This gray area is almost zero synchronization because the STDP doesn't happen if the uh, time difference is very small, but it doesn't matter too much for us. What's going to happen? The excitation will decrease considering plasticity when we have anticipation. And it will increase when we have delayed synchronization. So we're going to find a region of self-organized zero leg due to the spike time independent plasticity together to this transition from anticipated synchronization to delayed synchronization. The idea is that when we put everything together, we can reshape the synaptic weight distribution and we can find um, very similar features that is found on experiments. It means in experiments we have the synaptic distribution between two regions, master to slave, that it's an exponential decay here and with finite numbers. Okay, in very different regions of the brain we have these uh, similar feature. In our numerical results we also have this kind of finite synapses when we have anticipated synchronization. People, numerical results from people cannot find this decay. They need to put a upper boundary by hand and they find this b molo distribution here. So when we applied uh, plasticity in our models of anticipated synchronization, there is no synapses that grows forever. When we apply these plasticity rules in delayed synchronization, there is a probability to find very high synapses. That's what people usually do. That's what our model can do for us. So this is the third uh, phenomenon that we can explain. And this is my city that also has beautiful views. And thank you to Claudio, which is my main collaborator. Questions or comments? Ingo. I'm very fundamental question. Okay. What do you think is the 
role of this anticipates organization? Is it just a coincidental phenomenon, or do you think it plays then any functional role? And what could that functional role be? Because you, you said in the beginning, certainly you don't violate sanity. So if, for example, in some new information is provided, you first go through a transient phase. So you will not get a previous a past information processing. So what do you think could be the functional role? OK. I, I, a very nice question. We have think a lot of that. First thing is that there is no functional role for synchronization. So we just, OK, we just imagine. I can imagine that. Um, first thing could be these learning rules, uh, extra way of do computation. So we have amplitude, and now we have phase difference, and we can have positive and negative. This could be in a very ambitious way, we can think that this, this is related to our capacity of anticipate. Because in these experiments, we are looking for motor area and somatosensory area. And we are doing a test that we already know the task, but we're going to need to move. So our motor area already know that, but start to anticipate it. So the activity in the motor area it starts before the target really get to the screen because we know that we should move if it's necessary. But this would be very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Any other question? Well, if not, uh, Fernanda will be here until the end of the month. Most of the time in Palma, although we go for a conference as well. So thanks again. And Thank you.